Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. It's my great privilege and honor to interview Lieutenant Colonel Barry Bridger, who served in the United States Air Force, a pilot shot down over Vietnam and a POW in the Hanoi Hilton for seven years. As he tells his story, he gets so excited, he's tapping on the table for those of you who are listening by podcast. And that's the way they actually communicated in the POW camp. And so uh, if you hear the taps, 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 and you see hear some funny noises, that's him just so excited about his story, telling it and tapping it out as they did even while he was a POW in the Hanoi Hilton. So I know you're going to enjoy this. God bless you. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for joining in. Today, we are privileged and honored to have a true American hero on our podcast. I am so blessed. This is one of the men that I respect the most that I've ever had the privilege of meeting, and it's <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Barry B. Bridger. Uh, I would encourage the audience to divide all those nice comments by 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barry, it's such a privilege to have you on Spirituality Adventures. Um, I think we met probably sometime in the 1990s mm -hmm. at, when I was starting Vineyard Church at Lakeview Middle School. We were stacking chairs <laughs> together. That's right. <laughs> listening to sermons, both of which we needed to do. Exactly. And I met your wonderful family, mm -hmm. uh, Sheila, Courtney, Deidre. Right. and. Love your family so much. So, so, so honored to have met you. And um, as for people who are listening, we're going to we're going to kind of go backwards and start with Barry's growing up years. But, um, you know, the thing that uh, is so compelling about all of this is compelling. But uh, Barry was a was a U.S. Air Force pilot shot down over Vietnam, spent seven years in the Hanoi Hilton. And back in the 90s, when we were at Lakeview Middle School, I had Barry share uh, one of our whole services. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can remember your message to this day, and we're going to get to that a little later. OK, but I can I can remember your the things that you had to incorporate in your life while being tortured and in Hanoi mm -hmm. Hilton to survive. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and we're going to get to some of those things, but things like humor faith and scripture oh, yeah. and those kind of things. I oh, yeah. <laughs> they all played a role. Yes. But let's start at the beginning. Like, tell us where you were born and kind of your early growing up years. I was born in Durham, North Carolina. And after my birth, I was placed in the Durham County Orphanage in North Carolina, Durham County Orphanage. And I was there until I was almost six, I was five years of age, when the first family that had an interest in potentially adopting me showed up and invited me uh, to go with them for the weekend to be in their home. They had a son by the name of Ellis, who was about a year older or so than me, a big, big kid for his age. And uh, they had driven up to the orphanage with the expectation of taking an orphan on a weekend trip to their home. And I had been, I was outside at the time in the top of a chinaberry tree with my only friend I had named Billy. We spent our time in the chinaberry tree instead of with balls and bats because the older kids took it all. And so what we discovered was the older kids wouldn't climb up the top of the chinaberry tree, they were scared and we weren't. And we were like a bunch of Reese monkeys hopping around up there, having the time of our life. And if we could get hold of something, we'd take it up in the top of the Chinaberry tree. Nobody would come and get it. And I was invited to come in, walked in. And they said, this is a fake family. Would you like to go home with them for the weekend? I said, absolutely. I'm thinking of that thing called a car. I'd never been in one. I had to see what was in there. 
<laughs> cars would come up and leave, and I go, wow, we got to go look at one of those cars. And so I uh, had uh, cottontail rabbit for supper. I'd never had bunny. <laughs> and uh, the next morning I was up before anybody because everything I saw I had never seen. Everything was an adventure. Everything, including that goldfish pond that they had right. out front of their garage. And I'm look. I've never seen a goldfish. I've never seen a pond. Never seen a bridge over water. Nothing. Yeah. I was just lived in a world with a toilet and a green and brown paint walls with a bunch of kids at these big picnic style tables, all screaming and carrying yeah. on. And you love that pea soup. <laughs> I threw up in that, that daggone <laughs> commode more than anybody else, I bet. But in any event, the next morning, I was outside, and here comes Ellis. He finally got up. He walks over to the goldfish pond, reaches down and grabs a goldfish and starts squeezing it to death. I went into an absolute rage. And I knocked him out of the way, picked up his goldfish, threw him back in the pond, and then I grabbed his head when he came at me and was trying to drown him in the pond, and here comes his daddy. <laughs> they packed me up, it's... put me in the car, drove me back to Durham, and put me back in the orphanage, and my first venture outside the orphanage did not go well. Right. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't sign you up right yeah. there. <laughs> About a month or two or three, I don't remember how long, they showed up again with an intent to try me one more time. Wow. Well, I was delighted. I get to ride in that car. And they decided to go south from Durham to a little small southern town by the name of Bladenboro, B-L-A-D-E-N-B-O-R, Bladenboro, North Carolina. A population that time, maybe 600. Uh, wonderful people, hardworking, loved their kids, understood the importance of telling the truth, working hard, uh, being competent in what they did, being respectful of others, uh, and visionary in how they dealt with their community. So I uh, rode in the car down to that little small Bladenboro town, and the people that they were staying with, good friends of theirs, uh, the Hilburns, found out there was a little girl named Nettie Van that was having a birthday party the next day, and she was about my age, and wouldn't it be nice for the orphan to be able to go over and have some fun at the birthday party? So they drove me over there. As I stepped out of the car, all these kids I did not know show up with these little uh, blow toys with, that, I don't know what they remember. Party whistles or something Yeah, like that. you know, they blow out, you uh, know, and hit uh -huh. you in the face, and they were all blowing it in my face, and I immediately got mad. That's what I always did in the orphanage. And I started, whacking at him, you know, and whatnot. And here comes Nettie Van's mother, who shoos everybody away, sit, looks at me and said, Barry, do you want some ice cream and cake? And I, I knew exactly what that was. I had bumped into ice cream and cake. <laughs> and so they took me over to the table with the ice cream, dished me up some ice cream and cake, took me over, uh, and then handed me a plate. And and then they walked off, and I, I looked around like a wild animal. Because anytime I had anything in my possession, the older kids would try and take it. And so I'm looking around to see where am I going to go to eat this ice cream and cake so nobody gets it. That was my thought. And I saw a mimosa tree. I like mimosa trees. They got fragrant uh, blossoms on it. And this particular mimosa was in full bloom. And there was nobody around that mimosa, so I put my back up against it and I started to eat my ice cream and cake. And about 30 minutes into this, I look up and I see this mansion in front of me. It's got columns, it's got uh, slate walkways, it's got uh, azaleas and camellias adorning the entire yard and a great big magnolia tree uh, that's in full bloom. It, this was a sight for a kid who's never seen anything. Right. And Nettie Van all of a sudden appears beside the mimosa with me and says, Barry, would you like to go over and see that, that uh, home? I said, yes, ma'am. So they take me around the corner. I met this lady. Her name was Myrtle. And Miss Myrtle looked at me. She said, Barry, we're going to be talking in here. You do whatever you want. Uh, if you need anything, let us know. She didn't grab me by the cheek and shake me and say, you're cute and all this stuff. She just said, go, which is fine. I love that idea. So I'm flying down this car, this hallway with, that's got beautiful red carpet. And everything, every room, every corner is an adventure. I haven't seen any of the things that I'm seeing. Yeah, just being in a home oh, like yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. A piano. I've right. seen none of this. Right. And uh, 
I, I ran all through the house, uh, it, it, experiencing all kinds of things, like the man of the house was upstairs reading a newspaper, listening to the ball game. It was the Tigers, you know, the Yankees six, the, um, the Detroit Tigers five, and it was the last inning. And when I walked into the room, this gentleman dropped the paper because he heard me come in. He looked at me, put the paper back up so fast he disarmed me. I didn't have any reason to be concerned about anything. And he says, sit down over there if you want to hear the rest of the game. I kept on reading. <laughs> Never said a word. And uh, the Yankees won six to five. <laughs> and, and he said, well, the Yankees won. I said, thanks. I don't like Tigers. So I got up and walked out. So I could go on and on and on. There's a lot of other adventures associated with that. I'll let you keep talking. Well, this is the family. This is the family. That, it, that adopted you. Oh, that is an incredible adoption. He, yeah. And it's that's quite a God intervention, it seems to me, right? I would never, under current law in the United <laughs> States of America, have been adopted the way I was. It went like this. At the, uh, when Ms. Native Ann left, it was time for supper. And so Ms. Myrtle said, Barry, you want to eat with us? I said, yes, ma'am. They had this beautiful black American lady by the name of Maggie. In fact, I, I was running down the hallway because I was smelling food. And I went into the kitchen and I bumped into a lady that looked just like Aunt Jemima. <laughs> and she, I, 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 was, I felt like I was in the wrong place, so I turned to run out and she said, where are you going? And I turned around because she disarmed me the way she said it. And she says, come in here, I have something for you. So I go into the kitchen and she dishes me up blueberry cobbler. I've never had any blueberry cobbler. I thought I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and when I, it didn't take me long to finish. This was the first black woman, you, first had, black person ever you've ever seen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, would you like some more? I said, yes, ma'am. So she dishes me up and up. I had two servings of blueberry cobbler before supper began. Awesome. And then I had the blueberry <laughs> cobbler at the end of supper. I thought, this is really, this is adoption stuff. Of course, I didn't know it was adoption. I said, this this is really a great yeah. place to be. You know, That's I was enjoying awesome. Well, the next morning, Miss Myrtle comes and takes me downstairs and we eat breakfast with Mr. Henry and he goes to work. And pretty soon, uh, Miss Myrtle is doing some other stuff in some part of the house. And I'm sitting there at the table, and Miss Myrtle comes in. She says, Barry, come on out to the porch. Mr. Henry has something for you. I walk out on the porch, and there's Mr. Henry. And he kneels down in front of me on his knee, and he's got a little puppy in his arms. Hmm. And Miss Myrtle says, Barry, would you be our little boy? Oh, wow. And I never left. I never went anywhere except there. Wow. That was the way I was adopted. Now, behind the scenes, Miss Myrtle was looking out the window at the birthday party, saw a kid she'd never seen before. Who's that little boy at the mimosa tree, Nettie Van? Well, that's that little orphan that came down with the Hilmers. Oh, well, he keeps looking over here. I think he wants to see the house. So I go over, well, after supper that night, I went upstairs and Miss Myrtle showed me a room that her son McCray uh, had, a balcony, private bath, propeller on the ceiling. He was just coming back from World War II as an aviator and skilled aviator at that. And so I slept that night in, in, in an indescribable world for me. I'm in this great big bed with all of this par uh, aviation paraphernalia around me mm. and my own bath. <laughs> I am in a next day yeah. a puppy. And so that morning, after I went to bed, about three o'clock in the morning, I got up, I dressed, and I walked out of the house. And I started walking down the street. By daybreak, I was almost five miles down the street. Everybody was looking for what me. What were you thinking? Why I were was, you leaving the I was, house? I, because I was just enamored at everything I saw. Just everything so new. I had, I never seen Firefly. I never seen any of this okay, stuff. I gotcha, never seen anything. Gotcha. I was just and boy was I full of energy. And uh, so they've got the highway patrol. They've got the sheriff's <laughs> department. They got all the, <laughs> the whole the, town. Down, they're looking for this <laughs> the whole town. This damn orphan. You know where is this kid? Yeah. Well, I it's 
darkness falls. It's about eight or nine o'clock at night. I've been gone now for almost two days. Oh, Lord. And I'm walking around in swamp country looking at everything, hearing all kinds of, oh, 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 oh. No, I haven't seen nothing. I hear all this barred owls. I know what a hoot owl, a barred owl, a great horned owl, a long eared owl. I know all of them because <laughs> I lived it. But it's about eight o'clock at night and there's all gravel roads, dirt and gravel roads. And I'm bebopping along half his alert and I see a car coming. I recognize cars. And I see the flash and the headlights. I said, oh boy, I'm gonna stand here and watch that car go by. I was really excited. Car pulls up, got bubble gun on top, Smokey Bear hat on the guy in the, in the front seat. He looks out, the rolls the windows down, looks out there and he said, son, is your name Barry? I said, how did you know my name? <laughs> the place was exploding. They drove me back to the Bridger's house and I didn't run away again. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was adopted that way. That's that's, that's how I got a, adopted. That's, a, that's some divine providence right there, right? He, he put amazing. me where he wanted me. That's amazing. And he's still doing it. You know, and then you're in this room with aviation stuff. Right. A little foreshadowing of the rest of your life, <laughs> it right? It is foreshadowing. <laughs> so, um, so tell us just, because the, the book that just came out on your life that uh, Jim Peterson uh, wrote is called The Spirit to Soar. And the way he put this together is lessons in life, right? Exactly. Which, beautiful. I love the way you guys uh, mm -hmm. put this book together. Exactly. And there were there were life some, lessons, right? And there were some uh, some of the key le you because I, I want to speed ahead a little bit <clears throat> to your education and getting into your military career because of our time. But but what were some of the key lessons that you learned from this loving family that adopted you? What did what were the key lessons that you learned from them as you grew up? your elementary, junior high, high school years with that family into college? The first and most important lesson I learned, and I learned it very, very quickly, was as I had shared with you earlier, that in an orphanage, it's not uncommon for the smaller kids to have nothing and the bigger kids take everything that's available. It's just nature and the way it is. And so I, I grew up in a me first mentality. I had to fight for what I got and I had to do it all the time. And Billy was the only helper I had. So the two of us against the older kids. And so we got strong and started learning how to climb high into a China bear tree. Cause if we got something, we'd go up there and they couldn't get to it. And they wouldn't dare try. <laughs> that was our one advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but when I arrived in Bladenboro, and uh, my adopted mom uh, saw in me all of this energy and this uh, protective nature that I had and wanting to be first and to get everything. I was very aggressive and, and very, uh, uh, <clears throat> all very much uh, trying to take, uh, to, 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 uh, to capture everything I could capture for myself. I was self-centered in the first degree. And she sat me down one night and explained to me, and it was my first lesson in values. She said, you are going to learn that in this household, we take care of our neighbors first and we come last and so do you. <laughs> so I want you to understand that. Well, it took me a while to figure that out. In fact, I want to show you something. Where's that bag I Your brought? Oh, it's in the rocking chair. This is one of the most valuable experiences I've had in my lifetime. And I had no idea what the truth was about what I'm about to show you. But I'm gonna expose you to something that my mother, my new mother, wrote and put on my pillow oh, one wow. night. Okay. My dearest Barry, with all the love in my heart, I want to call your attention to a few things. Though I can't talk to you about it without a tremendous argument. 
I would always defend myself. We lost sleep about your failure to contact us on your trip to Sewanee. I had a car, I'm in high school, or I'm in early college, and I'm all over the place like a wild man. Don't think we weren't worried about you. If you had only told us, it would have saved us the anxiety of expecting you. It hurts, too, to think you have no more respect for our feelings. I'm, it must have been about 10 o'clock, no, about well, probably 11 or 12 o'clock at night when I started to jump in bed that night, I saw that letter mm -hmm. laying on my pillow. Wow. In fact, we have decided home only means to you a place to eat and sleep. You never stay here very long or long enough to even have a friendly conversation. I fear you're setting a pattern or habit for life that will follow you even when you get married and that will not work then. <laughs> she's, a, she's teaching you, right? <laughs> Wow. Let me finish. It gets really powerful. <laughs> Mom knows that all right. <laughs> um, you can double cross us now, but then it won't work when you're married and have a family. The world can't offer you a thing that will compensate with a happy home, life of family, devotion, and companionship when you have a home of your own. My prayer is that you will make a wife happy and be a loving father. My dreams will be fulfilled. Wow. That's beautiful. So that was my first lesson, a serious lesson in values. And quit thinking about your silly self, yeah. Roger. So it took you a while. Oh, oh. It took you a while to learn. <laughs> this is all that orphanage, orphanage yeah. mentality I had. Yeah. And I felt so bad. Interesting. This yeah. had a profound, forever, yeah. positive impact wow. on my life. Wow, that's great. I, that's that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's the truth. That's great. Thanks My for sharing that. My mom and dad were just, I do not have the words to describe how good a people they were. That's awesome. And beautiful. they meant every word of it when they said their neighbors come first. Yeah, beautiful. Well, let's uh, let's talk about, you know, you, you went uh, R, uh, like ROTC, do they still? ROTC. Yeah, ROTC. Like and, my brother was. So I followed, mm -hmm. foreshadowed, followed him. And went to, uh, you're Tar Heel. Yep, Tar Heel. Tar Heel and uh, studied mathematics mm -hmm. while you were in college. I had a reason for that. I did not like the idea of reading book after book after book and writing long essays and so forth. It's either right or it's wrong, and you figure it out real quick if you don't have. <laughs> then I could go on. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, yeah, I like math. Math is you right all, or wrong, and it's quick. You had a love for hunting, football, oh, oh, fishing yeah. oh, from a very that, young right. age. But you, uh, but but let's talk about your military career. You you okay. you get just tell, give us a rundown between you know. Between. Well, when I was in the ROTC program at Carolina, I uh, which I joined just because my brother was a pilot and, and I was very heavily influenced. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very fortunate too because I was there was about twenty five kids in my uh, class at Carolina that were in the ROTC program, and only about three of them were selected to go to pilot training, and okay. I was one of the three. Wow. So they were very strict back then. If you had any flaws at all, you were had to do something else. And uh, I was healthy as a horse, I guess, that China Berry tree and all that work I was doing running around kept me strong. So anyway. I think you still are. I was are. healthy now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I still do some interesting things. You still things. do stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> 
my wife is <laughs> receives phone calls all the time from my buddy. I said, don't let Barry go out on the river at night. <laughs> and she says, you can't stop him. <laughs> That's right. And it's true, you can't. Oh, my. Yeah, so you were in your, um, you, so you got selected for pilot training. I did. And, and so I went off to Big Spring, Texas, down in uh, 100 miles uh, west of Abilene. And I went through their um, um, pilot training program. And then at the end of that, they formed a board and they allowed you to put in what you wanted to fly, where, where you wanted to, what, what you would, what aircraft you'd want to fly coming out of pilot training. And then the board would decide which one you actually got because they didn't care what you, you know, if, if, we, if you disagree with the board, you lost. That's where you went. Mm -hmm. I wanted to fly a uh, trainer aircraft just to build time. And they said, no, you're going to a fighter. So they put me in right a in. four fighter. At that, and, and the F-4 at one time had the world speed record at 1,606 miles per hour and the world's time to climb record from zero to 99,000 feet in six minutes and six seconds. And that was perfect for me. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't believe I got that. Wow. So it had consequences lately. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But such an honor. And uh, that was, this is an elite group of people that you're uh, flying with, training with, all that kind of stuff. Very bright, very good people, mm -hmm. very talented. If you made it to the pilot training, you had probably the skills to finish. So the Vietnam War is going on. Yep. And this was 1960, what, when you when you were training for this fighter 67. jet? 67. 67. Yeah. And then as you flew 75 missions yep. at night, is that right? Yep. I was a night pilot. We, we had people who flew only day missions, and we had a squadron of about 20 guys that flew night missions. The night missions in the, you know, were, were dangerous because we had to fly fairly low because of, of anti-aircraft fire and stuff like that. But by the same token, and, and, and to attack our targets, what we were doing is interdicting truck traffic coming south out of, of um, North Vietnam, out of Hanoi down into the DMZ to supply the Viet Cong and to supply the North Vietnamese Regular Army. And we were looking for trucks running up down that system. Trying to hit supply trying lines. Trying to hit yeah. those supply mm -hmm. lines. And uh, there were a lot of karst ridges that stuck way up two and 3,000 feet that you could easily run into if you, got, if you were in the wrong place. Under the, land, under the uh, we had flares we'd throw out. And so you had to be very careful. So it was dangerous. We lost a number of people, even while I was there, that hit those cars ridges. So then after all those night missions. I finally pleaded enough that they gave me a day mission. A day mission. And it was actually a day mission to go shoot down MiGs. I couldn't have been more happy that I could have a chance to engage MiGs. Uh, that particular day, <clears throat> we were all also carrying a QRC-160 pod, which was a, a radar jamming pod. It would send out a signal that jammed the guidance signal that was coming from the ground to the missile that was flying through the air to hit us. And um, we were told that if your QRC-60 pod, when you turn it on, does not operate correctly, then fly up close to your element leader. So that's a flight of four aircraft. You had a lead and an and a element lead and so he says, their signal will jam for both of you. When I got home, seven years later, they said, if your pod's not working, do not fly up next to your element leader because you'll double the radar energy reflection and be shot and detected and shot down. And I went, uh, daggone. <laughs> good, good to know that earlier, right? <laughs> it would have been oh, nice gosh. to know that. Oh. I was just doing the, the old slow turn, like we're in formation, you know. Yeah. But, they were able to double the energy coming off of that. And they shot me down and a lot of other people too. Right. They shot down like 15 B-52s with that. Whew. Yeah, so, you, so you're so you all of a sudden spinning, right? You're upside down all of a sudden. I got hit, <clears throat> and when I got hit, I was running about 700 miles an hour and um, at a 24,000 feet. And the missile that came up through the clouds, I saw it, I called it out to the rest of the flight, and then I got nervous. There's something told me I need to do something other than to sit here with this general turn and with these other guys. And so I suddenly flipped upside down and split S. 
Okay. The instant I did that, the missile came in the back, exploded, knocked my right wing off, half my left wing in the tail. I was in a chunk. My back seater was flying. You're just a two two uh, aircraft uh, aircraft two seater aircraft. He thought I was dead after the explosion, and he ejected. I didn't hear him go. I was too busy looking at all the lights in the in my cockpit. I'd never seen them all come on at once, right. and <laughs> and they were the lights would say things like "You need to service your hydraulic pressure." Okay, you're you're overheating on the left engine. Your right engine's on fire, and all this stuff, you know. And oh. I'm sitting there looking at all this. I even saw a light I'd never seen that says "You're in deep kimchi." <laughs> I'm telling the film about that. One. But anyway, I'm sitting there with fire everywhere and all these damn oh. lights on, and I thought I'd probably ought to get out of here. So I reached down and, and shut my eyes real tight because I figured it was going to really be breezy. And I pulled the handle and boom, I went out. Well, I, uh, I had my eyes, when I opened my eyes, I, uh, I, I couldn't see, I was blind. And I'm going, okay, now I'm blind. And I kind of claw, claw, uh, clawed at my face and I discovered that my helmet is spun around on my head. I'm looking in the back of the helmet. So it spun it back around and I can see. And I'm going, yes, I can see. And I'm in the, the seat itself is being stabilized by a drogue chute. And it's going real smoothly at about 80 miles an hour down towards the earth. That day, the weather was very bad. Every 2,000 feet was a deck of clouds and real thick. And so I'm going through these decks, boom, 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 boom. And on the side of the seat is a, a, um, a sensor that senses 10,000 feet altitude. And when it does, it kicks you out of the seat and deploys your chute. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm looking at that sensor and nothing's happening. I'm looking down below me and all I see is a deck of clouds. And my brain is saying there's going to be dirt in one of those deck of clouds if that sensor doesn't work properly. Right. That's what my brain is yeah. telling me. And then my brain says, why don't you calculate how far you've fallen? Well, I see, I went out at 24,000 feet. And I my math, mathematical mind kicked in. And I calculated real quick the number of feet I'm going and how, how long I've been falling and how many seconds. And I said, the next deck of clouds, by my guess, either has dirt or is the one afterwards. I don't know which. I don't like this. I pulled a handle and separated myself from the seat. Now I've got to deploy my my shoot myself manually. Mm. So now I'm flying through these decks doop, 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 like this. And I, I'm looking for my rip cord, which I couldn't find initially. And I'm going, what? I looked at my shoot, uh, it's up over my head about nine feet on a strap. And I thought, maybe my, maybe my rip cord's up there and I'm pulling the shoot and I'm on my back floor, boom, 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 going down through the, and it ain't there. <laughs> and I happen to see it right here on my harness. And I went, oh, whoop. And when I did that, the chute inflated right here in front of my face and it bang near broke my back. <laughs> like this. I thought, wow. <laughs> and then I landed in downtown Hanoi. Oh gosh. So that's how I got shot now. Wow. So it was it was kind of wow kind of fun and then they captured kind my back seater first because he he was a big guy he fell a lot faster and they picked him up and they were about to try and interrogate me out there in the field when he showed up on the wow. jeep they took us both into Hanoi. So you 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 land in the you're captured land in the infamous Hanoi, Hanoi Hilton. Hilton Wallow Prison. Basically, this is 1967, right? Right. 23 January, 67. Yeah. And you spend the next almost seven years mm -hmm. in this, this, uh, you know, the hell, average, this average, hell hole. This the, hell yeah. hole. Oh, yeah. yeah. The average was five. Five years, average. That's pretty big average for people. And mm -hmm. you go through you go through torture and all that. And some, some of the top three torture techniques you've listed in your book here. Yeah, it's all detailed. Um, and I've heard you describe that. And uh, But um, what what I was so inspired by was, you know, obviously you you, en you endured so much, but how you endured it and the lessons that you grabbed onto with your fellow prisoners. Uh, give us some of those key thing what helped you survive with your other 
POWs that you were in there with. And by the, and by the way, you know, you were in there with some, there's some famous people that have come out of that place, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I like to say to folks, tough times await us all. What you value about life, about living, about being will determine the outcome. If, if you were captured by the North Vietnamese, you were placed into a concrete box. You had no idea what was about to happen. You were all alone with your thoughts and your values. Eventually, you were taken to an interrogation and given two choices. Cooperate fully with the North Vietnamese camp authority or go to the torture chambers. Now watch this. Without any idea what their fellow POWs had done, one by one, all of America's Vietnam prisoners of war exercised the values they held in common and chose the torture chamber. Hmm. Caring for one another was for us the right thing, the proper thing, the Christian thing to do. We did so naturally, instinctively, without forethought. In other words, our value system was on autopilot. It compelled us to act and thereby to survive. I can't, I'm, I met a lot of people up there, primarily just tapping on the same wall. I didn't see them face to face. And I was absolutely amazed at the fact that they had the same values I had. I could not have been more enthralled and happier to realize I was with people with that with that mindset mm -hmm. and, the, and and that willingness to step into the breach, no matter the consequence, and take whatever risk they must to help those in greater need yeah. than themselves. The, the news about the quality of the effort that we put into doing the right thing is a story that's never been told. Mm -hmm. What about the secret code that you guys invented your own code? Yeah, this is my dad is, is listening in. Richard Heron, he he loves Barry, and uh, I, yeah, and my dad considers you one of his heroes. So divide by twelve, okay. But, um, uh, the the communication of uh, the tap code, which consists of five letters, five rows, and five columns, produces twenty five letters instead of twenty six. And this was this Stocksdale that kind of invented, or is it no, all of you no, together? This, this or? the the the, uh, the original tap code. Uh -huh. was taught at all of our survival school as part of the oh, training. Oh, okay, okay. So that part of the communication was developed okay. and taught. Gotcha. However, it was very slow, very cumbersome, and very dangerous to use because any fool can put his ear on a wall and hear. So it not only allows us to communicate, it allows the guards to hear it. And if they heard anything, you were headed to the torture chamber. So, and it was very slow. If I want to say hi, I'm going. Instead of if I, later on, we developed something called the POW hand code. Now the POW hand code, uh, we, the guy that introduced it to us was uh, just a pilot that had bumped into it somewhere. I don't know where he found it or he may have invented it, but he brought it to the fore. And uh, the POW hand code, is like the deaf mute code, but it's not the same letters. The deaf mute code can be read at a very close range, very fast. The POW um, hand code can be read at 100 yards away by a set of really good eyes like we all had. Okay. And I'll give an example. If I'm gonna say hi, I'm going, or if I'm doing it with POW hand code, I go H-I. So it's hi zillions of times faster and nobody hears you tapping on anything and so it became the standard most powerful communication technique we had mm. we tried morse code we tried every code you can imagine but the pow hand code was worth its weight and go mm. that's beautiful i love the, the the idea that you just expressed um a part of the communication comment was one of the things that got you through was when you would give yourself to helping another person oh the, and it was the sacrifice and that's came came from your family 
because they taught you right when you got first. there. <laughs> <laughs> your neighbor comes yeah, first. Exactly. Exactly. And then that's what you lived out when you were Ex in the POW that's why, camp. I, that's why values are so important. I, yes. I, 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 I get tickled at all of the people saying, I wonder what's wrong with us. Why we can't get together? We don't value the same thing. Why would we get together? Mm-hmm. Now, the Lord has a hand in this. He'll decide when we need to start valuing the same thing. I have no doubt. Meanwhile, he says, you got work to do. You keep praying unceasingly to me, and I'll keep directing your path. And that's our, our pack. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, another thing that you shared about surviving this POW camp was the common faith that you shared. And I remember, I remember you saying that between all of you, it's like you came up with your own Bible. Like, I mean, because all of you had a different verse memorized or a different passage. It's amazing. Passage. It's amazing. Absolutely we did. You know. So I, you, uh, you collectively pulled. My, my favorite comment was, as you believe, so shall it be done unto you. Uh -huh. I love that passage in the Bible. Uh -huh. And the other thing that I, I, uh, I follow to the T, pray unceasingly. Hmm. And fear not, for behold, I am with thee until the ends of the earth. And on it goes. We're full of verse. My, my adopted family, they had me so full of the Bible in terms of verses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew a lot of them. Yeah. No doubt about it. But they, they put me into a position where I could experience this. And the Hanoi put me into a position where I lived it. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing I remember so clearly, and I'm going to have to have you tell one of my one of my favorite stories of yours is is how I mean, here you're in this dark place, you're being tortured. Uh, survival is, you know, it's just day to day. You don't know you what's going to happen. And but humor, humor was something that helped you guys get through this. Oh, absolutely. And, it, you know, America, Yanks will laugh at anything <laughs> for so for, for those of us who have never been in these kind of horrendous conditions. I mean, some of the worst conditions you could ever put a human being into. And yet you're finding humor along the way everywhere. How does that work? Well, I, <laughs> in uh, 1970, 71 time frame, they identified 36 Americans in the entire camp system, there were about 500 of us up there, that they considered to be troublemakers and instigators. And they put us in trucks and they took us across the city of Hanoi. And they put us into a punishment camp consisting of 36 individual solitary confinement cells. They were sending a message back to all of the POWs. And were you one of these? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. You were a troublemaker. <laughs> of course. Starts back in the orphanage. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, um, they, um, 36. They, put, they put us into individual solitary confinement cell, basically just a concrete box. And uh, they put us in a row. It was a, it was a shed with a... a, a um, 18 uh, cells on one side and 18 on the other, one after the other. And we were all in individual solitary confinement cells as an object lesson to the remaining POWs that you will receive some of the same if you become obstinate and don't do what we tell you. That was their goal. Mm -hmm. I'd been there maybe two or three days and I hear on my wall and I go, and this individual starts tapping. says, hey, this is John McCain. Who is that? And I tap back, Bridger. And he taps back, Barry. He knew who I was. And he said, I have a problem. And I went, which meant, Paul, stop. Don't do anything. Be careful. Someone's close. And I looked around in my five by seven foot cell and I said to myself, I wonder what John's got I don't got. <laughs> he says, I've got a problem. I said, oh, what, I, what, what problem is he talking about? <laughs> don't have this thing. So I go back to the wall and I tap to John. So 
And it was sarcastic the way I typed it. And so he starts tapping very fast, very rapidly. He's upset. And he goes, you don't understand. There is a big snake in my room. <laughs> I almost fell on, fell on, well, I did fall on the floor laughing. Because I grew up with snakes in the swamps of North Carolina. I had all kinds of snakes. <laughs> and I, I tapped to John. I said, now, John, slow down. Let me tell you what's going on. Oh, wow. I said, that snake that you're looking at is either a bamboo viper, a crate, or a cobra. Any one of which, if he bites you, you're dead in two minutes and 14 seconds. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. That snake doesn't give a damn about you. He's trying to find a rat. <laughs> There's rats everywhere. I said, and you notice all the holes in your cell. They, they bored through that soft concrete. They had all kinds of stuff. I said, if you just sit in your little corner and just bide your time, he's going to disappear in one of those holes and then plug it up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> John is going, damn. You know? <laughs> said, of course. He, he'd never been around snakes. Oh, all. that's hilarious. And so, um, I tapped back to him. I said, let me also uh, share this with you. There is a very large black tarantula on my wall. And the first time I saw him, he jumped from my from one of the walls to the other wall without over a five foot jump. And I've got to deal with him. <laughs> and I, don't, I, I can't go to sleep. <laughs> and you can't either. That daggone tarantula was about that big around. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I don't particularly care for the ranchers. So, you know, <laughs> I got to have you share the toothbrush story. Yeah, yeah. You know, the what now? The toothbrush story. On the, along the humor theme, you know, when you guys got issued toothbrushes, and uh, the one about uh, one, one of your buddies dropped his. <laughs> and, and, and oh yeah 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 well that happened all the time yeah but well, you got it you, you know it's just a part of the humor component um i'm trying to think there's that toothbrush was stuff was happening all the time I'm trying to think which one it was what do you what do you remember bristles up oh the bristles up <laughs> I can't. Well, you 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 told me that one of you guys had your latrine buckets, and you and one of your buddies had dropped his toothbrush. Oh yeah. And but your joke, I guess, was that if you dropped your toothbrush, as long as it landed bristles up, it was still good to use. That's right. Yes. And then one of your buddies ended up not just dropping it on the ground. He dropped it in the bucket. And dropped it in the bucket. <laughs> and I said, bristles up when I tapped to him. And he went, he and didn't he, know what to do, and he went in for it. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. He just shake it, find some water. He got it, it out. And, and, <laughs> oh, you won't notice it after and he, a while. And the, the joke, Hell, you can't the joke was, anyway. did it land in there, bristles up? <laughs> yeah. And he, he said. Yeah. He looked in, he says, oh, bristles up. <laughs> That's right. So it was already, it was good oh, to use. Oh, now I know what happened. <laughs> he was brushing his teeth over his bowl and he dropped it, but it landed on the floor. Well, the floor itself covered all kinds of crap, okay. you can imagine. Okay. And I said, what, what'd you do? He said, well, it landed bristles up, so no problem. I kept okay. on going, you know. I was thinking but it landed get, in but, your... <laughs> but getting into the humor thing, here's, here, here's an example of humor. <laughs> um, one Sunday... Uh, all of the guards were on liberty, except one. He was out at the, in the central compound, and he was supposed to take care of everything. And it's July. Temperature in the room was 118 to 22 degrees. It's just bleeding heat rash. It's miserable. And I'm bored to tears, and I decided I'd do something. So I'm in my little single cell, block cell, and I, all of a sudden I just went, and immediately here here he comes into the cell block he goes to the first cell he opens the peephole and he goes hold up, hold up. and you hear this yank go baloney no that not me God. he goes to the next one opens up his peephole hold up, hold up. all the way down he gets to my cell he opens my peephole and all I did was point to the next cell. <laughs> and he's got this expression, oh, it's that guy. So he goes over to Bob Peel's room, opens the door and beats the hell out of Bob Peel, shuts the door and walks back to his, his, <laughs> oh, his, his spot. 
Well, about five minutes go by, and I hear a tap on my wall. Bob yeah, and I are next door. I guess so, yeah, yeah. And he's tapping to me. Bob wants to talk. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I guess. I'm still laughing over I'm sure he wants to talk. And, and he, he starts tapping to me, and he says some of the nastiest things you can possibly imagine. And he says he's going to do things to me that are physically impossible. And he goes on and on with his tirade. And finally, he slows down enough, and I tap back to him. I said, now, Bob. I don't appreciate what you've been saying, and your mama would not be very proud of you right now. You need to, to, to consider the consequences of, of becoming uh, an individual that says such nasty things like that. You're a better man than that. I gave him this long spill. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and when we get out, I got him a date with Beth Bellamy, Miss Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh. And she's also a millionaire. And well, so you, Bob was happy with me. You that. made up for it then. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of them, this is, we talk about humor. Here's another humor. They took about 200, about 100 American POWs. And this was after the first big raid of B-52s. And they put, them, put us in trucks and they drive us into China. Then they turn north and west. And the road network goes into the northeast corner of North Vietnam. And that's with the same border that China has so that they can slip that 100 Americans across the border very quickly if we try another Sante raid or some kind of raid to re rescue prisoners, they have a trump card. Mm. And we were the bait, mm. 100. Well, the night we got there, uh, there were all these little buildings and a big fence around the buildings. And we called it dog patch is what it looked like. And so they pushed about 10, 10 guys into my little building they had into this building and locked the door. And uh, we're talking to each other. I'm saying, don't move, guys. We don't have a clue what's in here. I don't know how many snakes we got. I don't, know. <laughs> don't walk around in the dark. You can't see nothing. And about that time, this guard shows up with his little lantern, sticks it between the bars. It, it, threw, it would throw maybe light to your foot if you were lucky. And meanwhile, uh, Ross Terry, one of my buddies, is feeling the walls with his hands. And he says, hey, there's a doorway here and this, and this. Hey, there's there's a wood, soft wood bed in here, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm up throw my uh, uh, stuff down here. He had a little pallet and something to lay on. He throws you here, here it goes, thump. And about that time, this guy with the lantern's coming by that doorway. So Ross reaches out and grabs that lantern and pulls it inside in this room where this bed is and holds it up. And on the bed, going back and forth, it's about a nine foot cobra. All oh, flared out like this. Uh, <laughs> and, and Ross Terry goes, what? And the light goes out and goes, cobra! We all take off, running down through this concrete building. We have oh. no idea where we're going. We can't see squat. And we're gonna get there really fast, whatever it is. And when we get to the other end, we. We ended up in this pile of humanity, like Dallas and the Redskins, fourth and one. <laughs> yeah, you know? right. And I'm on top of this damn pile, the very top of the pile of this humanity, screaming at the top of my lungs, you guys on the bottom are gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hell yeah, we would laugh at anything. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, wow. Damn cobras, we had a lot of snakes up there. Man. <laughs> Well, um, gosh, there's so many great stories, and you've you've tell some of them in the book here oh, yeah. with with Jim Peterson, and um, but let's 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 talk. You you know, seven years, you go through hell, you survive it, and uh, and in in the bonus round that I did with you, you, said one of the one of your favorite moments and places in life was that bus ride. Oh, heck yes. Uh, well, I, I, and yeah. let, let's talk about that, getting back home, meeting your wife, you know, all that. So, yeah. What, what but, about that uh, one group that started singing that Christian song that you told me about one time in that they were over and they and it all, all of them started singing that church song? Your, dad, my dad's asking about... Uh, um, some of the songs that you would have sang christian songs maybe hymns in the when you're in the P, in the pow camp was that a part of the you you talked about 
I know the scriptures were stuff that you put guys put together collectively. <laughs> were there some favorite songs and the hymns? only time the only time that we we uh, did something along that line uh, uh, was when we uh, rebelled against the camp authority. And we had as many as maybe two or three hundred people in the central prison of Wallo, all screaming at the top of our lungs, uh, <clears throat> some uh, statement, and like, um, how what the hell? Let me give you an example. Um, I can't remember what it was we were screaming at. We. We, we, we got really upset with the Vietnamese and we protested is what it amounted to and we protested vocally at the top you could we shouted loud enough that anybody in the downtown city of Hanoi would have heard us mm. that was the idea to, to let the whole world know that the POWs were there and we were all in unison mm. and we did that on a couple of occasions but every time we did those things there was a consequence to be paid and usually mm -hmm. it was very brutal mm. Okay. Like, for example, we had about two or three different escape attempts, and the consequences were devastating to us. We had people who were literally tortured almost to death. Mm -hmm. Drag they drag them past our door, and you could see. You wonder why they mm -hmm. were still alive, if, if at all. So th those types of songs that we sang were in defiance mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, and usually followed by a very difficult. Uh, torturous consequences, like mm. hanging somebody upside down by his feet and beating him with a with a fan belt, and yeah. and, and and beating him till they drop him, and leave him there for about thirty minutes, and pull him back up and continue, because they wanted to find out who was pushing this and who was responsible, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> well, you ride home. You got out of this place. How did? What? What um, was the? Uh, we, we flew out of Gailam Airport, which was their central airport, and uh, we flew into the Philippine Islands. And uh, there was about a total of 550, the first wave, and that's an interesting idea, uh, thing. The first wave to go out that had been negotiated was the sick and wounded. And that was about 100 people on the first C-141. And then the next wave, which had been negotiated, would be those who would you go home in order of shoot down. So if you were shot down uh, early, you went home first. If you shot down late, you went last, that type of thing. And so the Vietnamese played a game. They switched it and decided they would send the next wave of people after the sick and wounded based on their choice instead of what was negotiated. And uh, so the uh, the Vietnamese came in to, to get these people to take them to the airport, and all of them said, no, we're not going home out of order. That's what the, the Americans said, that we're in prison. Pretty good. I like that attitude. <laughs> and so the, they, they brought in some people from, uh, from our side of the fence, uh, some, some majors, a couple of majors, to come in and explain that Henry Kissinger and all of the folks back in the States are thinking we're crazy because we're not coming home when we're giving them an offer. And we said, well, we're not going to do it. I, <laughs> Kissinger about had a cow fit. He said, what do you mean? We can bring them home if they won't come? No, they won't. They only come home in order of shoot them. So we were, we were negotiating ourselves. Wow. We'd already decided that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. Well, they sent in um, General one general, I, I can't remember his no. So the people in the longest were the ones that they were wanting to get. All of us agreed. We, see, we, to, our communications yeah. were so good. Yeah. We were all in agreement. We only yeah. go home and by order. And we knew mm -hmm. what the order was. Right, uh, right. And we'd already mm -hmm. been through that. Yeah. We knew exactly who should go next. And so they sent in, I think it was a major, I just don't remember his name. He came in and said, guys, look, they, they want you to come on home the way the, the, the Vietnamese negotiated it. But we promise you we won't do it again. That was the settlement. So we so it made them sign a, a pledge that, okay, after this, we'll only go home, only go on home in order of shoot down. Hmm. That was a real debacle. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I like that attitude, though. <laughs> well, it, it's that others first kind of thing. It, it, yeah. it, it is. Yeah. You live a life of others first, mm -hmm. you'll have a good life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so you got home in 1972. Three. Uh, oh, was it three? Okay. Four, four March 73. Okay. 
March 73, uh, back home to, to Durham, is that right? Or Well, what they did is uh, they put us into the Philippine Islands and cleaned us up and gave us a bunch of medical exams and so forth to make sure everybody was okay. And a lot of folks had divorces or other problems, so we had to resolve all of that. And then once you were cleared to go home, because they'd worked out all of any particular problems mm -hmm. or issues or health and so forth, then you either went to the East Coast, if you were uh, from that section of the country, or the uh, Omaha mm -hmm. Central, mm -hmm. and Castle Air Force Base, if you were from the West, and you went to a hospital in one of those regions. And I was from the Carolinas, so I ended up going to Andrews Air Force Base Hospital on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that worked. And then you went into another hospital environment with more tests. Once you got there, I was all, all kinds of tests in, in, the, in uh, uh, Andrews for mm -hmm. me. And then when you were ready to go home, you went, you, you, you went to a plus they figured out what assignment you were going to have. Then you went to that as a, as a final step. Mm -hmm. OK, and you. Um, I, I want to get. I want to get to you meeting Sheila, your your bride. Uh, you guys met in in the late seventies. Is that right? Uh, You've been home. You got home seventy three. Oh, you met in seventy three. Yeah. Okay. Because when we got um, when we got did back, you stay active duty? I did. And until and what we had to do is go become recurrent in the aircraft. So when we got home and finished our our medical care. Uh, in uh, either the east, central, or west coast. Mm -hmm. Once that was done, now it's time to go to your first assignment. But before you could go fly again, you had to go to a special program, which we did at Randolph Air Force Base, and um, come, be, become recurrent in flying jets. Okay. So I went there, I think I was number 16, to requalify. Oh, wow. And okay. now I can go join a squadron and go back to work. Wow. But first I had to become recurrent. Okay. So they, they did everything right. They did it well. I was very impressed with the way they handled that. And was it there that you met Sheila? Yes. Okay. What happened was Sheila is Barry's buddies, wife. Of, yeah. One of my yeah. POW buddies um, was um, invited to be a member of the judging contest for a beauty contest in um, uh, let's see, what it, San Marcos University. Okay. And uh, so... He came back after his beauty contest uh, and he said, hey, I met a, a young lady you need to know. This particular guy was already married and he was, of course, with his family. But he had met, he had become a judge and he had met Sheila. He said, I need for you to meet this guy. Named Look at this beautiful gal here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was Miss, Miss Chalimpiat. She won the contest. Miss Chalimpiat. Wedding picture. Yeah. All right. Pretty good. Yeah. And so um, what happened was <clears throat> I um, I asked him, well, where is this lady and what's her name and so forth? And he told me she was at San Marcos, that she worked in the administrative division, plus she was a, co a college student and finishing up her senior year and that I ought to meet her. So I said, okay, her name is Sheila, and she works for the administrative section. I said, that's all I need to know. I'm very confident I can take care of everything else. So I go over to San Marcos, and I'll find the administrative group, and there's a desk, and Ms. Sheila sitting behind it, and I walk up. I said, hi. She says, hi. I said, I need to talk to you. She said, no, no, you need to talk to the administrative director. I said, no, I want to talk to you. It's just not going to happen. You need to talk to me. <laughs> She's very stubborn. <laughs> so anyway, I did, I did get her to go over to a saloon nearby. We had a beer or so, and I got to know her. And then after that, uh, a week or two, a month, or whatever it was, I called her for a date. And she accepted. And the night of the date came, and I drove over to San Marcos and no Sheila. I'm going, where is she? She didn't and show I went up to for her the date. And I can't find her anywhere. She's right. not, just not there. And I'm concerned a little bit because she should have been there. And then about two days later, I get a phone call from Sheila. And she says, Hi, <laughs> this is Sheila. And I said, 
how can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> and I meant every word of it. I didn't appreciate her not being there. Right. And I, I said, how can I help you? And she says, oh, come on. Wow. Says, uh, uh, she says, I had, I went to, def- uh, to show my title at, 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 in San Marcos at a function. And I was doing that. And my car went bad. I couldn't crank it. And so I asked one of the individuals that attended the thing if he would give me a lift back to my hotel room. And his radiator uh, blew up on him. I said, I bet his radiator blew up on him. That's what I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, so what's that got to do with us? And she says, I, she said, you wanted to go dancing, right? And I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> But it didn't take me long to think about it. The one thing I can say about Sheila that is unique, I never was with her that I wasn't elated and happy. Yeah. Never. That's awesome. Brought joy to your She's life. She's a princess. Yeah. And an athlete. She played college basketball. She and right. got athletic kids. Right. Too. And then by the time I met you, of course, you were married and you had two, two beautiful daughters, right. Deidre and Courtney, both of which were athletic. Oh, big time. And the thing I always loved about them is they'd, they'd go out there hunting with you. They'd go out there fishing with you. I mean, these girls. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It was amazing. Absolutely. They're big time outdoors girls. I just like, I, I didn't meet very many people, many gals like them that would put on the camo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go stomping through the. I'll have to show you some late, late photographs. You would not believe what they're into. Yeah. Both of them have children now. Yes. They're married. Yes. And they, you, so you have some beautiful great, grandchildren, great, right? Great husbands. They're good kids. They're, yeah. they're filled with so How many grandchildren do you have right now? We've got uh, on, on uh, Sheila's side, I've got one grandkid named Gage. Gage is, needs watching. He is very determined little kid. He does everything, and he's like five. I mean, it's amazing. Is this Deidre's? No, no, oh, Courtney. That's, that's Deidre. Deidre's, Deidre's son, son is Gage. Okay. Gage. All right. Shotgun Gage. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Courtney has two darling little daughters and a uh, son by the marriage. Okay. Yep. Beautiful. So four Beautiful family. Yeah, so give us, so you're still hunting and fishing. Oh, you still yes. doing that, and, you're, and you've got a music, a budding music career going on right now, too. Well, I don't know how budding it is. But <laughs> La- it's, sure, it's sure as heck a lot of fun. I'll Last time I was at more. your house, you took me down in the basement, mm-hmm. played me some of the songs that you've uh, recorded. Mm-hmm. You're going for it. Well, I, I picked, like I said earlier, singers that I sing behind to learn how to sing Mm -hmm. and that's that's a pretty good way to do it Uh, and i've met uh i met um uh oh what's his name um ha god bless the usa lee lee greenwood yes i can't believe Uh he uh he was a lot of fun he gave me some advice too i said what should i do should i try over the internet help or should i do it in per- with somebody face to face he says face to face for sure that was his attitude all right but i met him up in washington and, and uh i sang behind him and then i pick other people like elvis or whoever and try to mimic yeah as best i can yeah and it, it's been a lot of fun to do it's that. fun it's fun so give us one of your favorite hunting or fishing stories of late just mm-hmm. maybe one of your funnest ones okay lately. i was uh that's Past April, I decided to go turkey hunting on the Missouri River, which I have done a lot. And so I put my boat in, got out on the river, and I'm floating down the river. And uh, to the west, I see this gathering storm. And it's getting black, and I can see bolts of lightning flashing in it. And I get a phone call, and it's Sheila. She says, are you looking to the west? I said, yeah, but I think I got enough time to kill a turkey. I think it's got to be at least 80 miles away. And she says, well, you better pay attention to that. You normally don't. <laughs> so I said, all right. And so pretty soon it's starting to rain. And that storm is coming fast. And lightning bolts are really 
lighting up the sky and I'm out in the middle of the river, which means I'm the tallest thing out there and that's not good. Which river were you on? On the Missouri. Okay. And I, I, uh, I'm thinking I'd better get close to the bank because at least that lightning that won't hit me if I'm close to the bank, it'll hit a tree. But out here, it could hit me because I'm the tallest thing up. Mm -hmm. So I worked my way towards the bank <clears throat> and um, I had a trolling motor. So I worked my way to the bank and now I'm flying down the bank. I'm about 30, 20 feet or so, 30 feet out from the bank. Just that, I must have been running nine miles an hour. And I, all of a sudden I lose power on my engine and I lose power on my uh, uh, on my trolling motor. And I look down the river and I see a barge. The barge is about 100 feet long. It's full of grain like corn. And it has these big metal cleats along the sides where they tie up these big ropes. Yep. And I thought, that may be my only chance. So I make myself a lasso out of a <laughs> rope. And I'm going down. So you're passing, floating downstream. And I'm flying down the stream, just yeah. flying downstream. And I lasso one of those cleats. Holy crud. And I very quickly take the other end of the rope and wrap it around the nose of my boat. That's going to jerk And my you. boat turns around and yeah. it's going right. like this. Yeah. And then I turned my phone on and I'm talking to Sheila saying, I think I may need some help from the water patrol. And about that time I lose power on my phone. Oh no. And uh, I, <laughs> Sheila is calling the water patrol and doing other things. My husband is out there on the Missouri River somewhere and we don't know where he is. And well, is he uh, on the Kansas side or Missouri? She says both the rivers is the boundary. <laughs> She's on both. Cause I couldn't be good like, like that. And so they get hold of two of my buddies. They said, hey, Bridger's on the damn river, he's in trouble. We're not sure where he is, but he said somebody's near four, 435. Okay, <clears throat> out west. And, yep, yeah. 435. Uh -huh. And uh, I, uh, I'm, as I slide by underneath the, four, the, underneath the bridge. Okay. Um, as I slide underneath that, I am able to direct my flow act, uh, direction so that I w slide out of the main stream into calmer water On the and I'm able to stop it and I tie up. Oh, wow. And about, I don't God. know, 30 minutes later, they, here comes my two buddies with a gas can. They fill me up with gas. I crank up. Everything's fine. I just go all the way back up almost within a mile of where I need to put the boat out, you know, to, to, to leave the river and ran out of gas. Oh, and now I'm going back down again. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. If you're going to do it, you might as well screw it up right. Oh, Lord. <laughs> do it with style. So they, but I survived. I, they I, managed, get, I managed to fix it. It took a while. I was late that night when I finally got home. Oh, gosh, it. Barry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I Well, Barry, I have, I've been so... Uh, grateful to know you and to i can i consider you uh one of the people that i i love dearly and your wife and your children and your whole family beautiful family oh yeah i've yeah. been privileged yeah. to know you guys thank you so much for your service to our country and to uh how you have shared your story with so many people to instill those kind of values we and, all have a story and lessons in others uh you've been an inspiration and one of the points you make in your book is that you never even know who you inspire right exactly you never know exactly you never know so i had a kid walk up to me one day and uh and uh at a football game uh, when i was a senior in college and he said uh he said i knew who he was my name but i didn't know him well he said barry he says you have no idea the impact you've had on my life right out of the blue mm. we do that a lot not knowing it right in a lot of places yes so you need to put your best foot forward and take care of your neighbor yeah but he i couldn't believe, i never had a compliment like that he said you have just inspired me but you know, mm. i like to say a, a spark makes a fire mm. that's beautiful
Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing some of your story on spirituality adventures. And uh, mm -hmm. I want to just encourage everybody. This book is is coming is going to be released in February. You've got advanced copies, mm -hmm. but Amazon.com already has the cover. And I think you'll be able to end up ordering that at some she, point. She says if you order because it's a less expensive. Oh, you can get it. That you should. There's a place other than Amazon that you can get yeah. it. Where the heck is that? Okay. Well, me... That's all right. Um, no, I, I remember, it's Morgan James Publishing. Yeah. I think it's this one right here, right? Uh, where's my suitcase? She told me to give you this, I think. Okay. Well, for our audience, by the way, you look at Barry's military awards in the back of the book, Silver Star Medal, Purple Heart Citation, Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, Prisoner of War Medal. This we, th these are his uh, his medals of honor. True, true, like true this. war hero, hero here. This is my family. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Who did that for you? Sheila, uh, working with Deidre. Ah, oh, that's gorgeous. But that's that's our family. This is Deidre. All this is her husband. Her husbands, this everybody. is yeah. Everybody's there in the family. That's the family photo. That's beautiful. Beautiful family, Barry. It is, no doubt about it. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thanks everybody for tuning in to Spirituality Adventures. God bless you. We'll see you next time. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.